Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Healthy Empath Podcast. Today, I am joined with my new friend, Tyler Ellison. He is a universal healing adult associate instructor, soon to be licensed acupuncturist, traditional Chinese medicine and health sciences graduate, extra dimensional channel, we'll be getting into that, as well as a certified narcissist and egomaniac. Tyler, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me here, Mike. It's great to be on the podcast with you, and thank you for inserting the excellent uh, titles that I specified. <laughs> They're awesome. <laughs> the first yeah, person I had to... introduce me is that. I, I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And just a, a note for the listeners. So just similar to last week, we did that, the episode with the, the channeler and they, I talked to them for about half of the time. And then the, the other half was, you know, talking to uh, and this, this being that we're bringing through and sharing a bunch of information and we're doing that again, two in a row, a back to back. And uh, cause I guess that's just what the spirit ordered and I'm uh, super excited about it. So Tata, can you tell us, you know, you're really into all these different uh, healing you know, modalities and you know, great, just, you know, healer, healing practitioner. You also do this channeling. Uh, how did you get into all this? Uh, it started for me when I was 20 just about then. And I started really experimenting with consciousness and I was really into psychedelic culture, um, music, media. And at a certain point, I found that that world became my greatest interest. And I wanted a way to explore the more subtle realms of life and also make an income, make a living. And I had for a while an interest in the body, in health, in consciousness. And at a certain point during that time, probably around 1920, as a result of following that path, right, of consciousness expansion, meditation, breathing exercises, altered states, I had a full blown the visionary experience where I essentially saw overlaid on top of my body all of the meridians i saw like energy orbs moving around i was seeing i saw like a bunch of entities in that same moment um it was like a full-blown like third eye cracked wide open and i wanted that experience again i was like i want that all the time i want to feel that connection to the psychic universe um because it was great that it happened right that's kind of what i was working towards but i wanted that to be my sort of normal state of mind but in a balanced way um, cause it was pretty intense, right? I like had to be in a really powerful state of stillness to perceive that vision. Um, and as soon as I, you know, became more alpha brainwave, then everything started to fade away again. So I wanted to reintroduce that state of consciousness, but as my normal state of mind. So that got me into energy healing, into yoga, and then into nutrition and wellness, uh, because I realized that if the body's not healthy, it's much harder to have those centers remain open and also have them be clear because if we're in a disease state or an inflamed state then that's going to create a stress response when we perceive the psychic stuff it's then filtered through a stress response which can really cloud the information so that was sort of my intro um, into that universe that world and all of these subjects i mentioned and then I just started going to school for it. Um, turned out I was pretty smart. I didn't know I was smart until I went to college and I was like, oh, it's easy. You just got to read and like repeat. And I was able to learn a great deal of material, pass tests. Um, and then I just kept climbing the ladder and acquiring the knowledge in the academic setting. And also along the way, acquiring different esoteric skills and understandings as I pursued my academic goal, which was uh, essentially be a natural doctor I didn't know that would be acupuncturist, but it turned out that was like the closest mainstream path to the psychic world in relationship to a healing modality. So that was what I ended up picking. And I still uh, prefer it as a form of wellness, the ancient Taoist and Chinese thinking um, about the body, because they think of the body as a whole system and not as little parts. And the idea is that it's the subtle energy that governs the chemical and material reality, not the other way around. So it's a, in my opinion, it's a consciousness based medicine. That's just my opinion. Other people would probably say very different things about acupuncture and Chinese medicine, but I see it as really the mind creates the body, 
the mind is made of chi, right? If the chi is healthy, if the consciousness is healthy, the body will then be healthy. And we have sayings, I think, in our Western sciences and medicine of what, like 80% of disease is emotional, right? It has like an emotional origin. That's a very popular quote. And I think that's sort of a testament to this idea that it's our consciousness that either tonifies or destroys our wellness. And uh, yeah, it's the most powerful tool because it's the tool that builds reality. So it's uh, my opinion, right? That's like the God particle. That's the thing to really focus upon everything else then falls into place when that atomic unit of our consciousness is nourished and supported. Great. Yeah, I want to ask a couple more questions related to the story and then perhaps we can get to some practical information about these healing arts and yeah, what they entail or what it, what it looks like so that people can put them into practice to, to really heal you know, their, their body, mind, and better connect with spirit and intuition. And so going back to yeah, this experience you had, this opening, was that something spontaneous? Was that induced by psychedelics or was it something else? Um, it was mildly induced by the weather and cannabis. So I, uh, I mean, at that time I was smoking a lot of cannabis, um, which I no longer really do because it's, it makes music sound cool, but, uh, you know, it makes me really hungry. And then I <laughs> just eat all the time. So it's not the most supportive thing these days. But at the time I was smoking a lot of cannabis and I had smoked some and there was this like intense thunderstorm that was occurring, like very unusual weather and odd synchronicities. And I was just meditating uh, while I was a little stoned from the cannabis in this thunderstorm. And then I started getting inner instructions from my own higher self, like, hey, get up and like go into your room, but move very slowly. And I was essentially being guided by that inner voice, to, like walk in slow motion to my bedroom. And when I made it to my bedroom, I just literally started having visions, like just closed eyed visions. And then I opened my eyes and then there was that overlay effect where I saw the spirit anatomy overlaid on top of my physical anatomy and then these other beings that were present as well. Wow, that sounds pretty cool. And was the, um, sorry, my mic did follow me again. <laughs> was the, yeah, so that experience going into that was that something, have you had similar experiences beforehand or was that like the first time you've seen anything like that? Not the first time, for sure. I had never had anything else beforehand. I mean, I had, you know, interesting dreams, I'm sure before that. Um, and then from, you know, playing around with um, different psychedelics and consciousness exercises, I had experienced, you know, some waking altered states, but nothing that was that. Um, nothing that was that almost just symbolic, right? It was like such a, a literal overlay of how people describe energetic anatomy, which was something I hadn't even seen yet at that point in my life, but it was like such a clear visual of that. And I, I psychedelics would show me like fractals and patterns back when I would take those, but nothing that was like purely like an Alex Gray painting. For those of you who have seen Alex Gray and the way he depicts the human body it was like I was literally looking at that on myself and um, that was the first time I ever had anything close to that ever happening and I've actually never really had anything like that happen since but um, you know that state of being is remembered and I think that was sort of like an initiation experience for myself to go into these deeper levels and I think that's what the guides do they'll show us something that's like so oh my god you can't really go back to what things were before because you just have this intense experience sort of burned into your perception. Yeah, definitely. And it seems like uh, within that too, they're also like showing you like, this is like what you're gonna learn. And yeah, cause that's related to, you know, acupuncture and all these different things, right? These energy meridians and the chakras and learning all about that. So it was like, yeah, imprinting that on you, but then also kind of like showing, giving you a glimpse of, you know, what you're yeah, gonna explore and learn and bring, bring about and so with the one thing I'm curious about is the psychedelics versus just other modalities now. And there's a lot of people who've done both or one or the other. And when it does come to achieving these higher states of consciousness or connecting, you know, within there. And I know from like the, a lot, some people I've heard from like the TCM perspective, it kind of shies away from them because it can be kind of like life draining in a way, like to your not like, 
um, or more so like just like to your energy body. So like the state of your health is really important when you, if you decide to do these things, do you have a, a take on that? Is it something, do you still, you know, if you're call, are you still called to that kind of stuff at all? Or is it just more about like these, you know, daily, you know, practices and really deepening those? Yeah. I think that when I was younger, there was a stronger attraction to psychedelics because it was just so alien. There's nothing, there's nothing like, there's nothing like it in our reality. It's the only thing of its kind that exists, right? It's like a material thing, a being or a chemical that can open up your awareness of your imagination and full agent. Like there's nothing else in the human experience that can do what psychedelics do. So I was really drawn to that. But the psychedelics, what they open you up to is something that is endogenous to you. It's contained within you, right? You have to take them and then you have this experience, but they're opening up something in you. So when I was younger, because I didn't know how to open that capacity up in myself, I was drawn to these things because I was, again, nothing does what they do. They're the only thing I know that really does that and that full HD clarity of just inducing visions and states of oneness. So I gravitated to that when I was younger, but after a while, right, they've, they help you open that up within you. It's already in you, but they help to open that door. So once that happened, it was like, do I want to have to take this chemical to experience that? Or do I want to learn how to turn that on in myself all the time with my own will and my own desire? And that became the path for me because you know, it's, I mean, right now in, in the US, right, it's psychedelics aren't something that uh, are legal, you know, so there's this like huge risk of taking them. And again, not just there's the legal risk of taking it, but there's also, again, what you said about the TCM perspective, the effect this can have on consciousness over a long period of time. Um, I mean, I see some people that take psychedelics and they're like totally fine. They're brainiacs. They're super smart and they're open-minded. And there's some people that take a bunch of psychedelics and you're like, oh, you take a bunch of psychedelics. Like you can just like tell that that person is like still in space, but hasn't taken acid in like a month. You're like, okay. So there's, there is sort of a trade-off with them, right? You're like really altering your brain chemistry. And, uh, I think that balance really is the key to longevity. So for me, it is the practices, um, particularly the Taoist practices that I find really assist me in producing my own endogenous psychedelic compounds like endogenous dimethyltryptamine, which are pineal gland, liver and lungs make. And it's like, if you can make yourself, your body produce more DMT and you can live the teachings that the psychedelics show you, then there's not really a requirement to take them again, you know? And I mean, I'm not saying I, I won't ever take psychedelics again, but to me, the teachings are now coming from inside, right? And if I'm literally seeking outside, in my opinion, I'm doing it wrong. Like, it's like, I'm, I'm not gonna find something out there, right? The teaching's never out there. It might get me into a state to receive it, but that teaching still comes from within. So, um, I, I say to each their own, if you're in a good state of mind and good health, right, and you're following whatever the guidelines are where you live, I think psychedelic therapy can be beautiful and powerful and transforming. Uh, to some people, it might be detrimental, though, right? There's some people that, like, probably shouldn't take psychedelics, right? They're, like, a little off in terms of their state of mind and their mental emotional balance. So I think it varies from person to person, but the practices open up the same thing. It just might take a little bit longer. It's more subtle, but... It's uh, what they call the immortal path, right? It's the path you can always take and you'll just constantly receive gifts. Not to mention what these can do to your energy body too, not just like, um, yeah, maybe a, they deplete your body from some, some nutrients or, you know, some you know, micronutrients from the brain or, or whatnot. But you know, I, I had a, so what you do before and after is really important. And then working with someone afterwards, because I just had a session with someone and it was um, brought me back to you know, what happened to me when I first did the, the, the five MEO DMT and basically like destroyed like all my chakras. It's like as if they weren't there afterwards because it was just such like an intense like blast off. And when I came back, I felt like dead for a few days and then, you know, I had to do some some work to reconstruct that. And then I just did a uh, facilitated a, a session for someone and you know talking to them and feeling it out I felt like a lot of similarities dude um to them and I, I was just like yeah man it's like 
it's like being shot by a rocket launcher, right? You're just like <laughs> opened up. So now like, you know, different like, you know, kind of entities or unwanted things can get in and you have all these like crazy thoughts that don't feel like your own or you've never really thought before. And so if you don't, if you just kind of go and like spontaneously do these things and that doesn't mean it wasn't, you know, you weren't following and trusting your intuition, but that does mean that it requires some, some serious, you know, work before and after to really take care of, of yourself and of your body. And again, of your energy body, because it could just rip you open. Mm -hmm. And so speaking of that and taking care of this energy body, you mentioned a couple of things there and with these practices that you like and the different Taoist practices, what are some of those practices? And then also with keeping in mind the, this something you mentioned earlier, this concept of you know, your intuition or psychic messages being filtered through a stress response. Um, I think that was really cool that the way that you said that and a really important piece to motivate someone to to really take care of their nervous system and calm them down so they can properly filter this uh, experience so can you yeah, talk about the practices that you like and how that does relate to calming your nervous system and then being able to connect with truth and intuition and spirit yeah sure that's something i'd be happy to speak about so the Taoist practices first and foremost are based on a technique called the inner smile which is completely amazing it's a meditation where you focus on your body and you're giving energy with your consciousness to your body charging your organs up with positive energy and in the Tao, they believe that the organs generate your consciousness in addition to generating your physicality so if the organs are healthy not only will your body be healthy and strong but your consciousness will be healthy and strong so it's a basic meditation that i think really everybody would benefit from learning because it's I said it's the art of self-love. It really is. It's the art of self-love. It's very powerful. And I like the Tao Path because with the charging up of the physical body, with the smile and the good energy, your body becomes tuned to that frequency. So you can essentially stay in that state. Um, that doesn't mean like emotions and challenges don't come up, obviously, but when they come up, you can deal with them from that state of focus, of relaxation, of love and joy. So even if you're experiencing inner or outer negative energy, you don't have to interpret it in a negative way. You can interpret it in this continuous positive way, thus integrating everything that comes to you. So you rapidly evolve. Um, the path also has a lot of techniques for emotional detoxification, which I think is really good. Um, Cause they look at emotions, right? As this natural thing, but it's like trash, right? If you have too much trash, right? Your kitchen's going to smell and it's going to be, you know, everywhere. It's going to be a mess and you're not going to be able to cook. You're not going to be able to live your life because you're so emotional. So they have techniques to detoxify and transform emotions as well. And they call it emotional wisdom techniques. And my favorite part, my favorite part of the Tao path is the sexual alchemy, where you can just use your own Kundalini, your own orgasmic energy to tonify your organs, to tonify your brain. So your body becomes a reservoir for this transformed sexual energy, which is like rocket fuel for your consciousness. So when you bring the sexual alchemy energy into the organs, you're, like I said, you're nourishing the physical organ, but you also nourish your consciousness with that. So you can really open up different psychic centers. You can open up different aspects of your psychology with that really powerful love force. So you can essentially be in a state of bliss pretty much all the time. And it's like an entire bliss path. And the, the Tao practices go further. I mean, you go so far into it. They have you doing stuff that's similar to Egyptian alchemy, right? Forming an energy body above you and putting your consciousness into it and you can use it to astral travel. There's so much in this lineage, the uh, universal healing Tao lineage that I think is absolutely amazing and is, in my opinion, like the most advanced system I have seen. Um, and I've like done some yoga. I've done some of the South American shamanism and it's, I, I, I love the other systems, but I feel that they don't contain as much of what excites me as the Tao path does. And all these techniques, right? Like you might've noticed I'm talking about using your own body to induce states of bliss, states of love. And when you're always tuned to that, that means 
that you'll always be channeling that caliber of energy. So if you're a channel like I am, where you let entities speak through you, this path is really nice because it assists you in making sure you're always in that positive state so you can clearly get those messages. Because sometimes if we're in, if we're in a, a stress response, right, and we're like, oh, this sucks, or oh, I feel bad, or oh, this isn't working, that's all the lower ego. Like the ego is not totally bad, right? You need some ego to feel like an individual and like a character, but there's what's also called the negative or the lower ego. And if we're channeling information and all that stuff's coming up, right? That means we're also channeling the lower ego, the negative ego, and that can cloud messages, right? That can create imbalances in someone's ability to streamline spiritual information. Um, and it can create biases because that's the nature, right? Of the lower ego, right? A negative bias. So if that's what we're tuning into, then the information coming through us is going to be a little off. And you can always tell if it's the negative ego because it doesn't feel good, right? It feels like judgment, right? Or it feels like repression or it feels like um, hatred or grief or victimhood, right? That's the place where the negative ego dwells. And if that's what we channel, then we're only going to be able to relay messages that are of that dimension, that are of that space. So having some kind of practice is really important to not only transform that part of the ego, but to also make sure we're tuned to these higher frequencies so that can be the standard of information that comes through. And whenever I listen to channels that are getting into, right, like there's some out there that get into like really fear-based stuff, right? They're talking about like the evil of the world and how things have the ability to like mess with you or possess you or steal from like, there's all these, and I, we all hear it, right? Even our non-channeled esoteric traditions talk about that. But whenever I hear that stuff, I'm like, that's coming from the negative ego. That's a place of disempowerment because ultimately we are creating our reality fundamentally. And if you truly believe that, if you really live by that, that means in order for another being to possess you or drain your energy, you have to be creating it. You have to be consenting to that experience. Um, and it's the lower ego that will tell you otherwise, that will say, oh, you're a victim. This is happening to you. It's not something you're creating with your consciousness. So the higher energy, whether it be the sexual alchemy and the energy from that, or the inner smile, or just living your life full of joy, right? With just, you know, being happy, all that allows for us to tune into those higher levels so that can come through. And so the information can be clear. Thank you. A few questions. First one, well, I get most on what you most recently said. How do you discern information? What, uh, what is the best way? You know, you mentioned those channelers with you know, these kind of messages. I've, I think I might know your answer, but I want to hear you explain it. The, yeah, so how do you discern from uh, different channelers or different spiritual teachers or anything really in your life, any place you get information? Um, how do you discern? So I just go back to the simple which is, is this a message of positive empowerment where there's something from this I can utilize in a very positive way to transform my life, help myself and help others? If that's not a part of the message, it's not a message I desire to align with. So I know it's not for me. It's just right there, right? If it's, if it's positive, if it's empowering, and if there's takeaways I can use to assist myself, it's a good message by my, my, my own standards. That's my own opinion. But if it says the opposite, right, if it's saying people or beings are out to get you, you know, you're all, you're doomed, you know, ultimatums, these sort of things, then I'm like, all right, that's for somebody else. Clearly, that's not for me. Okay, thank you. And the next question, oh, when you mentioned this sexual energy, sexual alchemy, can you explain that a little more just for people who are unfamiliar and you know their imaginations may go crazy when they hear that if they're not don't actually know what that what that is or what that looks like sure. so we all obviously have sexual energy within us right there's arousal sexual energy which is just that state of oh i like feel good i'm stimulated i'm excited and then there's the orgasmic state of the sexual energy which obviously we access through sex or masturbation but both of those energies just simple arousal or full orgasm can be as an energy brought from the genitals to different parts of the body to charge up the body with that energy, which 
heals the body in very powerful ways. On a physical level, it helps the DNA replication process. That's what the Taoists say. And then on a spiritual level, they say it grows the soul and the spirit of the person when you bring that sexual energy, be it arousal or orgasm, to the major organs, which if you pay attention to those listening in the beginning, the Taoists believe that the major organs aren't only in charge of your body's health, but they also hold your consciousness. So when you bring that sexual energy, be it arousal or orgasm, to the organs, you're helping your consciousness evolve with that sexual energy. So this is a practice you can do where you don't even have to like touch yourself. It's literally like you just feel the arousal and you just learn how to breathe it through the body. There's some muscle contractions involved. There's some that can be done while you're self-stimulating, which is more fiery of an energy. And then there's some you can do when you're getting close to orgasm, which is even more intense. And then this can be done solo. It can be done with partners. If you're celibate and you're like, I'm not even going to touch myself, you can do this practice. There's versions of all of it. And this is the hidden secret of most world traditions, um, especially traditions where people are celibate and they develop these mystical powers. It's the sexual energy that helps them to open up these higher centers so they can develop the cities. And there's many channel texts talking about Jesus doing these practices and actually doing these practices with Mary Magdalene. Now, not claiming that's true objectively, but I just pointing that out there. There's a lot of people that tune into this stuff and they say that's how Jesus was able to do a lot of his miracles. Um, he was accessing the power that's from within him. And that's why he says, you can do what I am doing and more, right? In the Bible, it even talks about him saying that, right? So it's implying that anything we saw our favorite earth-based ascended master doing, we can also do. And it's believed that the tantric or the sexual alchemy path is the path that can help us to really accelerate our consciousness. All right. Thank you. And the, well, part of that, yeah, I'll just make sure to clarify. It doesn't mean, yeah, you're running around having sex with a bunch of random people. If anything, I think a lot of these, these texts say that's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It depends on the text you read. I, I've, I've seen some Tao texts where they say have as much sex as you want with as many people. <laughs> <laughs> that say the opposite you know it's different schools of thought and it's it's you know it's an it's a form of human connection that's the most sacred powerful thing and the most vilified thing depending on who you ask so always go with your own flow you know it's i think that's important yeah and do you recommend montak chia's books to learn more about that since um so or, I, or something else i if there were other people for me to recommend i would but I have not seen anyone cover the material as extensively as he does. It's so, especially his books or his uh, webinar trainings, if you have the ability to join those, I highly recommend them. You get so much material. Um, there's another individual I've seen, one other guy who actually worked with Montauk Chia, and I'm gonna do my best to get his name right, but Charles Muir, M-U-I-R, He's another teacher I've seen who's actually done retreats with Montauk Chia. And he's, from what I understand, more of the yogic tantric path. But I would say he's probably the other person I would uh, recommend. I wish I knew more people, um, but it's just been the path I've been on. So these are the fellows that I have seen. But I know there's many great teachers out there. And you know, if you feel, those of you at home listening, this is a path for you the teacher will show up through synchronicity. Um, but I would say, make sure you, especially with the sexual stuff, make sure you're aligning with someone who has a good reputation, someone who's been doing it for a while, because um, you know, it's, a, it's a touchy subject. You wanna make sure you're working with someone, right? Who's been doing this, who's ethically teaching it. Um, so all those things are important, but yeah, Montauk Chia in particular would be the teacher I'd recommend for most folks. Okay. One more question. I was going to ask Ryok this. I keep wanting to say Ryok. It's Ryok, right? There's, he doesn't really have... Yeah, he doesn't really care. I know he wouldn't care, but... <laughs> when it first came through, it was Ryok. It was okay. Ryok. And I just sort of started saying Ryok, and then he doesn't ever introduce himself as that. People just call him that. So I sort of set that tone. But you could say Ryok, Ryok, whatever you like more. Okay. And I'm going to ask a question, and then I'd like you actually to just explain him and that a little bit and hopefully people listen to the episode before this already um you know have a bit of an idea of channeling and are excited about it and just want more so the but i did want to ask you i was going to ask this to to him and it was this because uh, they they teach 
Uh, so by they, I mean Ryok and the, the collective that he's a part of, I guess you can call it that, a, a, a lot about following your excitement. And that's like one of the main teachings. And I wanted to ask you about following your excitement versus almost like following your, I don't know, it doesn't say right to necessarily call it, say follow your fear, but sometimes we have to do things that is not exciting. And that's part of our path. So that means facing our pain. That means, you know, having the uncomfortable conversation. That means quitting the job. That means getting the job. That means, you know, breaking up with someone. There, there You don't feel excitement. You feel dread, but you just kind of start to feel like, well, like I, I feel like I have to do this in part of my path. So do you have anything to say about that, this difference between the two? No, I'll definitely say this. Um, that's a great question to ask him because he'll like go really deep with you in that direction. Um, but what I'll say is this, we as people, going back to that idea of the negative ego, right, which is the part of ourselves we're transforming, right? It's that shadow aspect of us. That thing, which God bless that negative ego, love you little guy. Um, but that thing is full of bias and full of judgment. And then we'll look at our highest path. The thing we know is for us, right? Which is also the path of joy. It's the path of bliss, holistically speaking. It will look at that path and it will say, oh, that's, that is scary. Stay away. Or, oh, that's like, you know, evil. Stay away. Or oh, that's shameful. Stay away. It will judge that direction and make it look like this deep, challenging, uncomfortable, horrible thing. But that's only our own judgment about the direction. The direction itself is not necessarily that. So that's, that's what I would have to say about that because leaving the job could totally be the path of bliss. That just might be one part of the path that feels a little murky because of that judgment about it and the definition that says that's going to be hard, that's going to be uncomfortable, something bad will happen, right? That's all the negative ego projecting onto that option. But leaving the job, right, that might be your path of bliss because you know it's a stepping stone for the next most exciting thing for you. So I don't think that the uncomfortable and the path of passion are mutually exclusive things. I think oftentimes they're one and the same. Um, it all depends on, I think, how you're looking at it. Because if you look at the emotion as the defining quality of that path, then it's like you're looking at a cloud and you're saying, oh, that's the whole sky. Yeah, so perhaps you, you, know, you feel, you probably do feel excitement for like half a second and then immediately comes up you know all the stories and the fear and the this and that uh because yeah when you're exploring you know what am i supposed to do next you know what conversation have i been avoiding like you might feel a hit of like i know what i have to do but then that might very quickly just change into that yeah all like the the lower ego stuff coming up afterwards so it no longer feels excitement it, uh, you know feels all these other things but you know that there's a deep excitement behind it and a lot of times the nervousness and excitement you know feel the same way in like your solar plexus too so, okay, and then about, yeah, the, uh, if you don't mind, we'll switch into the uh, channeling, talking about, I'm going to start off asking about health and wholeness, and so I just listened to another recent channel you did, uh, which would have been great for here, maybe I can touch on it again, but before we do that, can you, do you just, do you have anything to say about, you know, yes. the, this? The guy that I've called Ryok or Ryok is a being that I perceive to be in the future who acts as a representative of my own soul. So what I mean by that is this is a single being who exists as I perceive as a member of an entire extraterrestrial family. And he's so advanced, he can look inside of himself and he can see his soul and he can see all of his soul's incarnations that are all occurring at once. I'm one of those other incarnations. So he can look into himself and see me and tune into me and deliver messages to me from his reality and he can also since he's looking at his own soul to access me he can tune into all of the other simultaneous lifetimes that are being had to draw upon them for information and context to then share that with me as well so i see him as a extraterrestrial representative of my own consciousness my own soul in a bigger sense so he talks about all types of stuff. I mean, he's helped me out in a lot of ways. I've seen him help a lot of people out in the sense that he just helps people break down where they're sort of tripping themselves up, what might be holding them back, and how they can use their imagination and their innate power 
to co-create really whatever is most exciting for them because that's how his whole species lives. Their whole reality is based off of synchronicity, joy, and love. And they're essentially in an enlightened society where everybody's operating that way all the time because they've observed there's no point to do anything else ultimately, right? Anything else to them would be like a less fun path, right? So they go in the direction of their bliss and their fun all the time because they recognize that's the path that leads them to their highest form of evolution. And as a species, they say they are hybrid people. So they are partially us and they are partially another species that have been genetically created. So they're very different than us. Like they're a little alien, like they are a little different. Like you've never heard him talk before other beings from his collective talk. They are a little different than us, but they can also hyper relate to us because they're genetically linked and they understand in many ways what we're going through and they can experience that same stuff within themselves through that DNA, but they experience it through the love, through the joy and through the passion. So they're able to relate to us, but they're also simultaneously very alien at once. Awesome. Thank you. I'm excited. Uh, how long should I, I'll keep an eye on the clock. How long uh, do you have from here? Um, we could, we could do 20, 30 minutes, whatever okay. feels good. If we're at 20 and you still have stuff you want to get into, we can, we can push it to 30, but uh, 30 would probably be the cap. Perfect. Awesome. Well, so fun. Thanks for uh, letting me channel on your podcast, Mike. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's gonna be great. Well, I will dive in and touch base again at the end. All right, we thank you all so much for your participation in this co-creation. It is our civilization's highest joy, passion, excitement to be able to speak to each and every single one of you through this unique format. How may we be of assistance and service to you in your experience of physical reality? Thank you for being here. Yeah, this is a podcast called The Healthy Empath. We're a group of just humans on, on our soul's path. You know, some sensitive souls, empaths, healers, healers to be. And right now, I want to start the conversation off talking about this concept of wholeness. And that's what I've been kind of guided to lately. You know, not focusing on being holy, but focusing on being whole. And I know we all are already whole. But what does the path of wholeness look like for us humans right now? Well, understand, it's simply recognizing that which already is, for you're never not experiencing wholeness fundamentally. However, you can create through the idea of your own illusions, the idea of you not being whole, of you not being complete, but that's just that, an illusion. Fundamentally, you are already complete, you are already whole, for you are an extension, an expression, a fractal of creation, of source, of all that is. So knowing this, you can never not be whole. You can never not be complete. And what we observe for your society is the progression in the collective recognition that that is your natural fundamental state. And many of you are experiencing this in your own unique ways through following your joy, through following your passion, which is a positive frequency. You go into a state of harmony, of wholeness. And when you're in that state of harmony, you feel how you are in that way unified with all other aspects of yourself. In other words, you observe how you are, as you classically say, a drop in the ocean of creation. And as you follow your heart, as you follow your passion, 
That is how you mechanically speaking begin to induce within yourself that recognition that you are already whole and you are already complete. For it is the negative frequencies that tell you otherwise, that create the illusory sense of being separate. For negative energy in that sense is contractive and induces mentalities similar to that of isolation and solitude. So understand that when you're in a more negative state of mind, you begin to perceive yourself from a point of view that seems to amplify the illusory quality of fundamental separateness. But when you're in that positive state, when you follow your joy, you experience the natural harmony, which assists you in observing the natural wholeness that is. So we see you all collectively learning how to follow your joy, follow your passion in all moments, which has a very momentous snowball effect that will build and over time will become the selected collective mentality and way of life for all of you. So when it comes to you know, being in this energy and that wholeness in these higher frequencies and you know, following that advice, some people might paint a picture of their head that they're supposed to be you know, this happy-go-lucky, joyous person all of the time. But then in our human experience, that's not always the case. And that can lead to a lot of judgment when we are feeling you know, sadness and pain and grief. So what does it look like to stay connected to our wholeness while we navigate the ups and downs of the human experience? Well, first and foremost, recognize that just because you may be emotionally experiencing something that maybe feels negative or non-preferred, that does not mean you're ever operating outside of your natural state of passion, your natural state of joy. For it's all a matter of perspective. For even your negative emotions, your non-preferred emotional states can be experienced, can be handled, can be integrated can be played with from that natural point of view of passion. Just as you can look at another person who maybe is angry or sad with an angry or sad face on your own expression, or a happy smiling face saying, I'm here for you, I'm with you, you have the same ability to work with yourself and your emotions in that way. Thus allowing for you to always be aware of your underlying fundamental nature so you can use that underlying fundamental nature to integrate whatever challenge emotionally speaking may come up for again they're not mutually exclusive the idea of what you call the negative emotions and your natural state of passion for they are all contained within the same system they are both experienced from within your body so they are unified by you the idea is to learn how to hold the polarities and you hold the polarity through the idea of observing the middle ground between the light and the dark, the neutral. And as you allow for yourself to experience that neutral point of view, you can then observe from the neutrality, your natural positive state, and you can also observe from the neutrality, whatever the uncomfortable emotional expression may be, thus allowing for you to hold that neutral ground so you can use that positive energy to integrate, to process, to play with, whatever the temporary emotional experience may be. But if you judge it, you're simply matching negative energy with negative energy. It's the neutrality that allows for you to see both the light and the dark from that neutral, non-judgmental perspective. So you can then utilize the positive perspective to then integrate and process whatever the experience may be. That makes sense. And I've, I've had that experience as well. And when you start to do that, then, you know, when you do, you know, say something tragic happens, you know, you're able to kind of, you know, see this overarching bigger picture and or find beauty in it uh, and joy. And so when I do that, I feel like I'm connecting to sometimes I'll call it like my soul's perspective. So if I were to look at things from the perspective of my soul, I wouldn't see, you know, the, the passing of this particular person as necessarily something super sad. I may feel sad and I may cry and grieve, but I'm, I feel like I'm also connecting to some type of greater beauty um, within that. So oh, when I refer to that as like the soul perspective is, would you have a, a, another or way to word that or a better way to word that? Well, in that way, you are connecting to the greater perspective of your own being. So to call it the soul perspective is accurate, 
There are other terms. Some may say you're connecting to the higher self point of view, but again, your higher self is simply a middle ground between the idea of your physical incarnation and your soul. So in many ways, the terminology that you are utilizing is accurate from our point of view. Okay. Thank you. And so relating to physical health and the, can you talk about the importance of our physical health and, you know, going through on this, this journey. And I listened to you know transmission also from you and talking about this, um, you know, using our, our body and our health as a symbol for what's going on within our consciousness. Can you explain some of how that works? We'll understand that everything in your reality, externally speaking, as well as internally is a reflective mirror it's reflecting back to you some aspect of your own consciousness. So when you experience the idea of an imbalance within your own body, your body as a mirror is reflecting back to your conscious the sensation of an imbalance within you. Now, fundamentally, you are unconditionally balanced. And it's from that fundamental balanced place, the natural perfection of what is, that you create all experiences, including the experience of being imbalanced. So your body as a mirror will show you aspects of your own consciousness that are utilizing belief systems, that are utilizing energies that represent imbalance. And it's the imbalanced perspective within you that creates the experience of a state of imbalance within your body or within your lifestyle, behavior, etc. Understand your life is but a dream. And just as you can look at a dream you had last night and you can break it down into symbols by saying, oh, look, I went into the ocean. What does that mean? Oh, well, the ocean represents emotions. It represents the underworld. It represents things about myself. I I had not seen maybe things that were submerged within the depths of myself. And you can apply that kind of symbolism to a dream symbol. The same can be said for your life. The same can be said for your body. So the idea is to observe what the symbolic meaning may be in relationship to the imbalance that you perceive within your body, that you perceive within your health. The only reason you create the challenge of the imbalance is so you can observe whatever the path of passion is in relationship to it, thus allowing for you to transform and transcend that imbalance so you can experience a greater level of yourself. When we say greater level, we are referring to a version of you that is more allowing of your natural state, that is more explorative of who you really are that is creating and living their life from that point of view of joy, of passion in a greater capacity. So we would encourage you if you find there's an aspect of your health or your body that is out of balance to ask yourself, what is the symbolism behind that? What does it symbolically represent for different body parts and different conditions and different symptoms will be reflecting back different meanings but it's up to you to be the master interpreter of your living lucid dream. So you can understand what that symbol then means. Okay. And it can be different for everyone, right? Not every symptom is the same thing. Uh, it's going to be dependent on the, okay, thank you. And then, so relating to that one thing, a couple things that are on the rise uh, is poor gut health and food sensitivities. What are some examples of this like food sensitivities or food intolerances and just like not being able to, you know, digest and, you know, having a, a negative reaction after eating a particular food? It relates to a few things. One level of it relates to the idea of difficulty in processing the challenges of one's life. In other words, it relates to an individual believing that they're unable to handle what's going on within their reality, that it's somehow bigger, more powerful than they are. And as a result, their digestive system, which breaks things down and processes that, which is in some ways a metabolic challenge, then reflects that belief of I can't handle, I can't process the challenges within my own reality. Another level of this relates to the idea of understanding that your gut microbiome 
reflects back to you, elementally speaking, the soil or earth elemental quality of your planet. And through the idea of collectively choosing to not live in balance with your planet, with nature, for many of you, that imbalance will reflect first and foremost in the gut, in the digestive system, representing, again, the soil or earth level of your planet. And these are some of the reflective meanings we detect within the symbols you have inquired about. Mm. Yeah, I'm getting some chills on that on that last one. So I want to explore that a little further. Uh, from what I hear, the soil of our planet is um, doomed, <laughs> destroyed. Uh, some will say ear. It depends on the version of Earth that you're on. Mm. And so when people we hear people say that you know perhaps the soil might not even be savable, uh, is that just a story that we should choose not to believe because everything can heal? Now understand that. When someone presents to you that type of perspective, they are sharing with you something that is designed to act as a call to action so you can make different choices in your own life that represent greater harmony with your earth, greater harmony with your planet and its ecosystems, thus shifting you, vibrationally speaking, to a different version of earth with a different probable future with a different present moment quality of soil. But if you match the energy of that prediction and you do not make those changes, then you increase the probability of that non-preferred future with depleted soils being the future that you experience. But understand that news only comes to you to act as an external reflection so you can have the clarity within your own perspective of how you can take positive action in relationship to balance with your planet so you may experience a more balanced planet. For with every choice you make, you are shifting to another version of Earth with a different probable future and a completely different past. Just as you cannot step foot in the same river twice. The same is true for the idea of the new you that has made the new choice. You cannot literally be on the same planet anymore. You cannot be experiencing the same possible future potential anymore or the same past. You must be from that new choice, a new person on a new planet with a new future, with a different past. And that's how you can use these external sources of information about your planet and your ecosystems positively. For you don't have to attempt to fix every problem, as you say, environmentally, but what comes to you comes to you so you can make a change within yourself to shift to the version of your planet that you prefer. Okay, so for an action, you know, we could all take instead of getting uh, caught in fear and saying, oh no, we're doomed. We say, thank you for this message. Thank you for this reminder. I'm going to make these changes in my life and then, you know, choose a, a greater reality. Does that sound like good advice? Precisely. Yes. Okay. And then, so our bodies, um, most people, we don't, weren't really given an instruction manual upon born or being human, right? We've forgotten. It seems like we've forgotten how our body works. And most people, yeah, just yeah, the breathing patterns patterns are you know not healthy. The movement patterns aren't. Eating patterns aren't. How would you describe how our bodies work? Understand that your body works as a complete micro ecosystem, and it contains within it the same basic elemental building blocks that your external reality contains. And as you observe the idea of your external reality, your planetary being that you all live upon, and how its elements work together, how its systems work together, you can more easily understand how your own elemental systems work together. For understand, your planet is your greatest teacher, for your planet is you. It is a collective consciousness. It's a collective heart-mind that teaches you and instructs you. And your body, again, works as a microcosm, elementally speaking, of the whole, of your planet, of the cosmos. And as you live in harmony with the cosmos, with the planet, which again are just greater levels of your own self, they're not forces outside of you, they are projections of your own infinite nature, 
you then allow for yourself to experience your most naturalistic relationship with your own body. But first and foremost, the body exists so you can have the incarnational experience as a human. And so you can learn to live in relationship to all that is from that perspective, which contains within it great challenges. But again, these are challenges you have all signed up for and you are all well aware, so to say, of the nature of these challenges before, linearly speaking, the incarnational experience occurred. But your earth will teach you. Your animals will teach you. And you can learn through living in harmony with the earth, learning about your earth, learning about your planet, how your body works and what that instruction manual is. For the instruction manual is there. It's just many of you do not pay enough attention to your planet, do not pay enough attention to nature. And as a result, you create the experience of not having an instruction manual, but it's a living instruction manual that's taking place all the time all around you. Fundamentally, in terms of health and wellness for your body, the body needs natural foods that are rich in life, in vitamins, in minerals, mainly plants. The body requires purified water that is not contaminated, that is rich in minerals and other compounds, as well as the idea of detoxification, as well as the idea of clean air, as well as the idea of balance on the mental emotional levels of the self, which these other levels can assist with, such as the oxygenation, the hydration, the nutrition. The body needs rest. The body needs movement. And again, these are not things that are new. These are all things that you know. These are all qualities of your earth, of your ecosystems. And as you pay more attention to them, you will find that these qualities within you will begin to grow. But in terms of protocols, these are very basic protocols that you can use to nourish your system. And they are the same protocols that you can use to nourish your planet. Beautiful. And a lot of people the, have these patterns of uh, struggling with consistency when it comes to, you know, health habits, a very common thing. So for, you know, dieting, this constant, you know, yo-yo dieting, and then, oh, let me start again on Monday. Oh, let me try this one. Let me try this fad. Let me try that. And then just kind of always in this pattern. Um, and even, you know, people who maybe, you know, or someone more like myself, you know, sometimes I'll go into phases of more kind of regimented and routine and then you know it just completely slips away so what advice do you have for someone when it comes to creating a type of consistency within their health routine or maybe are they just being too judgmental and you know just kind of you know keep experimenting with different things or is there some type of subconscious uh block like a fear of success when you know of actually being too healthy or uh, what advice do you have there for someone who's goes through these uh, cycles well, understand that what determines the protocol, what determines the regimen and the consistency of that protocol, the regimen is first and foremost, the state of being, the frequency that one is in. For if one creates a regimen out of a state of being that relates to judgment or shame or lack, then that will be a regimen that is not sustainable for them because those are not sustainable energies. They are, in that sense, destructive energies, so to say, in ways that you don't prefer. Not that all destructive energies are negative, but those types of energetic, energetic states oftentimes break down the idea of the energy in a way that you don't prefer. So in other words, if a regiment or a protocol is selected from a negative state of mind, eventually that will break down oftentimes in a negative way, because that's the nature of the state the protocol was created from. But if the protocol is created, selected from a state of love, joy, passion, excitement, and that state is maintained, then the protocol will remain. 
And it may flow, it may change as you flow and change, as you always do. However, it will remain in the sense that there will be some structure that is based in wellness, that is based in health, that is based in vitality, that you will feel excited to continue utilizing as long as you remain in the state. But as you know, if you let go of that state and you choose a state you don't prefer, that positive protocol may then seem unattractive. So the idea is like attracts like, and when you create a positive protocol from a positive state and you stay in the positive state, the protocol will remain attractive and it will shift and change however it needs to change, but it will still be a match for who you are as a new being in that positive state. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I'm focusing on the energy of which it's created. And because sometimes people create these or want to create these habits and protocols to stay in a higher state. Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I feel like I need to start this so that I'm in a higher they vibration. To experience a higher state. However, they are not the inducer of that state. You are the inducer. Yeah. So it's important to even go back and see where that's coming from. Okay. Because it's your energy, your state of being that creates the reality. Remember, you are in a lucid dream and it's from your frequency, from your state of being that you select what occurs for you consciously and subconsciously within your lucid dream. Your health regimens are no exception to that. Okay, uh, shifting a little bit here. I had an experience one time. So I used to, I guess I still do sometimes, I connect with a lot of different energies, you know, just psychically, psychically in, in my own experience. Um, and then before when I was still a very strong or stronger than now ego structure, there was a lot of attachment and confusion there and just wanting to learn more and know more. And then I would, had a, a mush, was in a mushroom experience one time, psychedelic. And, you know, even, even said to these energies, I said, where are you? You know, why aren't you here talking to me? <laughs> and they, you know, I just heard from every cell of my body say back to me, we are you. And then, so my question here is, when we connect with a spirit guide, when we connect with a, a power animal or something, is that just an expression of our psyche or is it actually something more on its own? Both. Okay. Both, because if you did not have a quality of your own psyche that was a vibrational match for that other being, you would not be able to experience the other being. But understand, just as other individuals are projections of your own psyche, just as they are projections of your own consciousness, they are also their own beings, their own dreamers. The same is true for a spirit guide or a power animal. They represent your own projection, as well as the idea of their own uniqueness and their own unique sense of self or collective self. I love that answer. That's really helpful. So yeah, if I'm having an experience with Tyler and I say, oh, well, you're just a mirror of me. So part of my you know, expression. So therefore you don't exist. <laughs> that wouldn't be true. You know, it, it's both. Correct. Um, he exists so thank you. His own reality as his own dream of himself. And also he has a form of existence. So to say in your reality, which you are creating in terms of your experience of him. All right, nice. Uh, so lastly, can, can you connect to any uh, messages that might be helpful to bring through to anyone listening right now? We will deliver a message that relates in some ways to the title of your podcast in relationship to health and being a healthy empath. Recognize that again, as we have said at the beginning of this transmission, that everything that you experience is a reflection in a mirror. For those of you that may feel you are very empathic and you can perceive and feel the states of being, the frequencies of other, understand that that is your creation. That is happening, so to say, because you have created a version of yourself that is able to perceive the idea of other individuals in that way. You are also, through that awareness, creating the idea of the energy states of the individuals that you perceive, for it is all your creation. Now understand these individuals, of course, have their own existences, their own energy states, but you are actually unable to perceive that. You cannot perceive their version of themselves as they do. You cannot perceive their own version of their own energy as they do. You can only perceive your own version of them and your own version of their energy, 
which is a perception that is allowed or disallowed by your belief systems of what is possible. So recognize that when you observe qualities within another person through the skill, through the sensorial perspective you call empathy. Again, you have the ability to interpret that as a dream. To say, what does that energy state reflect back to me? Why would I have chosen to create this kind of person in my reality and that kind of energy state in my reality that they're utilizing? What does that mean to me? What is that communicating to me about myself? Because remember, you don't create consciously or unconsciously randomly, so to say. It may appear random, but it's synchronous. It's all organized. You're not always aware of why you're organizing things in the way that you are, but the idea is that every experience you have is part of a greater timeline, a greater series of parallel realities, of experiences, of events that are all interconnected that transcend linearity. So whenever you're experiencing the state of being of another person through your perspective, you have the opportunity to say, what does that mean to me? How can I use this information positively in an empowered way in my own life? For that is, from our perspective, one of the underlying questions that you can ask yourself to maximize the gift that you call empathy. Being able to feel through your own perspective, the state of being of another person. And you may find that for those of you that feel that ability is somewhat overwhelming through choosing to look at the energy of others as something that's not overwhelming, but is actually a gift that you can use as a source of information so you can create context for yourself in relationship to moving in the direction of your passion, creating the reality of your preference, being the you you prefer to be, then you will have no choice but to experience that feeling as a gift. It might feel intense, it might feel pleasant, but you'll only be able to experience it positively when you utilize that perspective of they are giving me a gift, a gift of information. And that can allow for you to develop a very healthy and fun relationship with that extra sensorial perspective that you call empathy. And you will find that what you call empathy is a stepping stone in relationship to other extrasensory gifts. And as you hone your relationship with your own empathy, you will find many of your other gifts will begin to open up. And you receive those other gifts when you use the current gift of empathy positively. And this relates to an overall evolutionary process that is occurring for your entire species to different degrees. And this is our gift to you. And we invite all of you, tune in to the state of being. If you wish, use your empathy to connect to our energy to understand what it is to be Sasani, what it is to be a hybrid, for understand all of you, two different capacities are also hybrids in the sense that to be human is to be hybrid. For understand a great deal of the genetics that make your body up and help to make up your experience of your own consciousness are extraterrestrial and utilizing your empathy to scan into our frequency can assist you in understanding those hybrid aspects of your own genetics. And we thank you for your attention in this transmission. Thank you, thank you. While you're doing that, I'm gonna talk to the audience for a minute, reflecting on a couple of things that stuck out to me when he was talking. And it was this aspect of that, yeah, so many empaths are they they feel something from someone else and they kind of keep it on that other person and you know and just oh i wish i could help this person and it constantly put it outward and they're saying to really bring that back in you know how can i reflect on this within myself uh, what is within this gift what is the symbol all that kind of stuff and then another aspect uh i think first rule of being a healthy empath is don't identify as an empath <laughs> um that um yeah made a 
that was actually yeah, the, the first thing that came up made a lot of sense to me because if you as soon as you start identifying as an empath you are already creating these uh, stories and these assumptions and all these different things so it's like yeah you, you can still just like you know we still need an ego but you don't identify with it same thing here so first rule of healthy empath don't identify as an empath all righty we'll wait for tyler to get back and we'll close up we thank you for your highlights and we thank you for this opportunity to share experiences and perspectives from our world and from our kind our unconditional love to you and to all of you whom are tuning in to this transmission. All right. Hey, yeah, I was just reflecting on a couple things that stuck out to me. I thought the conversation was over, but apparently you were you were still in it and they were listening <laughs> and like said bye again. I was like, oh, didn't know you were listening to me. That wasn't meant for that. But uh <laughs> they like to say they like to say goodbye and give the they like to share the love at the end to remind people, I think, of their their essence and what they are. Because a lot of people are like, I don't know if I can trust ET, so I know they like to give their I love you to people at the end to remind them that uh you know, that heart connection is something they also experience and they also share. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was great. I appreciate it. And I'm also glad I, I did the, the interview before this because I feel like I got some practice. Talking, it's weird, like interviewing or whatever you want to call it. You know, talk, having this like conversation, it's, I mean, it's hardly a conversation. So you, with, a, with a channel, right? It's not meant to be like necessarily conversational. It's just like you ask a question and you get a very direct answer and kind of go to the next question. So I, I got some practice last time. So I think I think I did a little better this time. Yeah, I mean, but, uh, it was a great flow, man. I mean, I was like kind of like way in the background listening in, but I, I loved the conversation between the two of you. I thought you asked some great questions and I thought, you know, it takes great questions to produce great answers. And I, I thought the answers were awesome. So it's a testament to your inquiry, my friend. <laughs> Good, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so things can you just share how people can touch base with you, connect with you. I think they can do one-on-one -on -one, uh, readings with uh, you and Rayok and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, that's correct. So if somebody wants a private session, they can visit my website, which is yinyongchanneling.com. And they can also email me directly uh, for sessions at tellison700 at gmail.com. And um, we have tons of events coming up. I'm doing an event with another channel uh, named Gita Rose. We're doing a three day event. It's like an online retreat camp starting this Friday to Sunday, which we still have openings for. So if people want to join in, that's the 21st to the 23rd. And then I we have- I don't think this will be out by then, but- oh, No problem. <laughs> Catch the replays, those be for sale. And then um, we're also August 27th, if this is out by then, um, we're doing a transmission from Ryoke called The Keys to the Anunnaki where we're gonna be talking about human creation myth and how homo sapien came to be homo sapien. Some of the, yeah, the elements of our sort of extraterrestrial origins. So that's gonna be the 27th of August, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That sounds fun. Perfect, so those are the best ways. Any uh, social media or uh, YouTube channels? Did you, make, did you say those? I don't I didn't say, thanks for reminding me. Um, there's Health Thyself, it's my YouTube channel. And then on Facebook, you can find me at Yin Yang Channeling, um, which is, the, I think, the, the thing that comes after the slash if you uh, got on Facebook and we're typing in the URL section. But, uh, but yeah, Yin Yang Channeling, Tyler Ellison, you can find me right on Facebook as well through that. Beautiful. Thank you, brother. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah, you got it, Mike. Thanks for having me, man. Much love to you and uh, your, your family who's tuning in, man. It's, it's great to connect. And this was a lot of fun. I appreciate the, the space uh, you've provided for me to express myself and share my story. It's uh, always fun. You know, it's fun to tell your own story sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's great. All right, guys. That's a wrap.